All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Neil Romanowski. I'm the Dean of Libraries. And uh, it's really wonderful to welcome you all here for what is our first in-person Authors at All event since, I believe, maybe early spring 2020. Um, so really wonderful to, uh, to be with you here all, with all of you here today. And um, really honored and privileged to have Adger Hounds joining us um, for this conversation about his work and beautiful book, um, Adger by 21st Editions Press. And Adger will be in conversation with um, Julie Demermuth, who is the director of the School of Art Plus Design. So really a great conversation today. I'm looking forward I don't think so. to it. Um, a tech note, unfortunately, the live stream um, is not working. So but um, we are going to record the session and make it available on our YouTube channel. Um, and Jen was chatting with people in the waiting room on the live stream to let them know uh, we, we do our best. but. It is what it is with technology, but so glad that you can all be here today. Um, and I do just want to take a moment to thank uh, our library's events coordinator, Jenna Harvey, for her work on today's event, as well as several other members of our team, um, Phil Skochik, Robin Wooten, Kevin Koppelkamp, Kate Mason, Mimi Calhoun, Charlie Nick, and Michelle Jennings for all their work on the event. And last but certainly not least, uh, I want to thank and introduce to you all Dr. Miriam Intratour from Armand Center for Special Collections, um, who initiated and coordinated Adrian's visit today. And um, I'd like to welcome Miriam to the front of the room to introduce our speakers. Thank you again for being here. Thank you, Neil. Um, and hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here this afternoon. I'm thrilled and absolutely honored to introduce our guests for today's Authors at All. Julie Demermuth is a tenured faculty member at Ohio University's College of Fine Arts, School of Art Plus Design. Her creative research field is in the areas of painting and drawing. Julie has participated in solo exhibitions and group and juried exhibitions in both the United States and abroad. Her research employs painting and drawing as sites for investigation examining aesthetics of holidays, the psychology of celebrations, and posing questions around our relationship to sites of ornamentation. Most recently, she has developed new biomedical arts courses and a new undergraduate certificate in biomedical arts. Julie has been teaching at Ohio University for the last 17 years and is in her sixth year serving as director of the School of Art Plus Design. Today, Julie will be in conversation with Adra Cohen. Born in Columbus, Ohio, Adra Cohen's turned down a full music scholarship to Capital University to become one of the first African-American students to earn a degree in photography from Ohio University. He studied here with Clarence H. White, Jr. Cohen's then attended the School of Motion Picture Arts and School of Visual Arts in New York City. As the first African-American film still photographer in Hollywood, he photographed over 30 sets alongside directors including Francis Ford Coppola and Spike Lee. In 1958, Cohen's joined Gordon Parks at Life magazine. As a mentor, Parks encouraged Cohen's to use his camera against racism. While living in New York City during the 1960s, Cohen's became a founding member, member of the Kawanye Workshop, a civil rights arts collective who used their talents to undermine racism against black communities. The collective was a driving force in the black arts movement. Cohen's photographs and paintings have been shown and collected by the African American Historical and Cultural Museum in Washington, D.C., the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Whitney, the International Museum of Photography, the Museum of Modern Art, the Studio Museum of Harlem, the Cleveland Museum of Art, the Harvard Fine Art Museum, Detroit Art Institute, James E. Lewis Museum, and the Getty Museum. Cohen's numerous awards include recognition of a distinguished career at the 2001 Florence Biennale of Contemporary Art, a John Hay Whitney Fellowship, the Martin Luther King Jr., Cesar Chavez, Rosa Parks Visiting Scholars Award from Wayne State University, and the Lifetime Achievement Award from Brown University. Please join me in very warmly welcoming Julie Demermuth and Adra Cummings. So it's such a privilege to be here and uh, I just just listening to that list. That's amazing. And I, I don't know, know who that is. 
that. <laughs> well, we all want to know who that is. <laughs> we all want to know about your life and your career. And kind of starting us off, um, I know Marion said you were here in the 1950s, uh, studying photography with Clarence White Jr. And you were one of the first black students to get a degree in photography. Um, I know you and I have chatted a little bit about this, but what was it like here at Ohio then, at Ohio University? Ohio University was, uh, at that time, was a little country now. Um, everything was close. Everybody knew everybody. There was only one black family in the town, the Saunders. Uh, and all the children were very talented. Philip and uh, Ronnie was a jealousy. They all were very talented. But it was a real country town uh, in the sense that um, in walking around outside the university where people had never seen a black person before this in the 50s. And they looked at me very strange. And some asked me, where are you from? And I would say I was from Columbus, Ohio. They said, well, you know, are you a foreigner? And they had lots of different questions. But on campus, it was, it was good. And uh, I had a great time. I had great teachers. Clarence H. White Jr. was terrific. Uh, Walter B. Allen and Betty Trucks. Well, Walter B. Allen was a real hippie at the time. <laughs> and then Don Roberts was a really unusual character in the way that he talked, but I learned a lot from him. And then there was Trisolini at the theaters. So I was in the black and the black. But it was it was a nice campus. Uh, I think that year that I got here, there were only 22 black students uh, in my class that came in out of the, I think about 10,000 students that year. <clears throat> and I first lived in what they called the barracks because I guess uh, at that time, uh, Ohio University had been, had been a uh, base for the Army, I think. And so I lived first, as able to teach was a barracks. And I had a board job because my parents couldn't afford to pay for the whole tuition. So I had a board job uh, all four years ago. But um, it was real hometowny, you know, like real country. <laughs> but the knowledge that was here, especially in the photography department, for me, it was very interesting because Clarence H. White's father, Clarence H. White Sr., had been one of the artists to show in Stevenson's gallery. And Stevenson is considered the father of modern photography. Um, so he brought Picasso and um, just a lot of different artists he brought from, from Europe. And, um, and first time that people had seen this kind of work, you know, um, so he, he was a real leader in bringing photography to the forefront. I mean, when I said that I was going to come to Ohio University and study photography, my father said, why would you want to go study a hobby? <laughs> it's just a hobby. It's not an art. It's not a, you know, and photography at that time was considered a hobby. And it wasn't a uh, something you did to make a life living and work out of. It just went, to be a photographer was to photograph over and over this and for you know, the newspapers, um, stories from magazines. It wasn't really the kind of career that you could, you know, make a living from because so, uh, it just wasn't, it wasn't happening. <laughs> so what was the impact of your time here on your career? My impact? Wow. The, the impact of being here at Ohio University. Well, I think the knowledge that I got here uh, was the impact. You know, I learned a lot. And I kind of actually found myself to a certain degree because um, I was basically lazy. I didn't want to work. <laughs> I didn't want a job, you know, once in a while. I never wanted a job once in a while. I had a few of those, but, you know, in the summer I would work when I went home and I would have two or three jobs to make money. I worked with Tim Kimball, Marion Company, and then I worked at the American <clears throat> Air Conditioning Factory. So I did two jobs you know, to make money when I was in school. But I think that learning was very important for me here. That's, you know, I was exposed to things I wouldn't have been exposed to, although my mother was a very educated woman. And uh, I knew Paul Arnstein Dunbar and uh, Paul 
Paul Robeson, you know, things like that, you know, black history. And my mother would read, you know, poetry to us and stuff. So I came from a family, a big family. So I grew up with, I would say, a typical American family, only black. That's great. Do you, you've got a chance to walk around campus a little bit today, but um, what do you feel has changed at home? Everything. <laughs> Everything. Some of the old buildings are still here, like the photography building was just, you know, it was a big barn. Uh, and that's all that was in that building was photography. It wasn't that big, but um, the information and the knowledge was, was great. And to learn you know, what photography was all about. And uh, I guess what I really learned, and that was later on, was to, I showed my work to people. That was my big secret. To see what they would say about what they saw. And in doing that, I learned about that person. You know, they said, well, I don't like that, or I like it, or whatever. It gave me a window into their head. And that was around my junior year really got me excited about that I could make something that would move somebody to say something about. To me that was, that meant that I had connected with them in some kind of way. And it didn't matter about the color, you know. I mean, I had a very good buddy, he was white, his name was Taylor Chadwick, and we were everywhere on campus, you know. In fact, he helped me get my first life because he lived in New Jersey, you know. And we hung out, and I was pretty friendly with uh, James Corrales, who became very famous from here. He photographed a picture of the march in Selma, and so the sun is in the sky, and you see the whole line of people. That's his photograph. And Paul Fusco photographed Kennedy, the Kennedy train that went around, and he was on that train and did a whole book on that. So they were both graduates, you know, from Ohio University. And I think that when we <clears throat> went to New York and we were hanging out, nobody had the knowledge and the information that we had. You know, when I left here, I knew how to take a picture. You know, I went and worked with Gordon first days. <laughs> Do you know how to load holders? You know, four by four holders. I said, sure. So we went to the dark room and he closed the door and he, <laughs> he gave me four holders. He had about two holders. And they cut the lights. Let me know when you're ready. I said, okay. He said, you're making a lot of noise over there. I said, yeah. I said, yeah, I know what I'm doing. I said, so he took my He said, I'm not, yeah, yeah, I'm not finished yet. After that, he never questioned my ability or my knowledge about photography because he realized that, you know, I knew what I was doing. Because in those days, if you wanted to be a photographer, you studied with another photographer and learn from him, and then he would give you some of his clients, you know, to uh, get work like that. So you learn it was on the job training. There weren't any schools. Ohio University was the only school that gave a degree. Uh, I think Arizona State had a, a uh, program, but they didn't admit Negroes. That's the word then. They didn't say black, so we don't admit Negroes. I mean, those days are very bold about whether they, you know, would admit you or not. It wasn't like, oh, well, maybe, or, you know. And then after the Black Power, everything changed, you know, even before that. But I think that <clears throat> at the time, OU was the only place that gave a four-year study course, you know. And then later on, they added a master's degree. But, and I felt that the information that I got at Ohio University, you couldn't get anywhere else. You know, Clarence was very thorough about what he was doing. And he had all that history of students behind him. We didn't have books. There were no books you know, or in the history of photography. But because his father was who he was, he was able to show us prints of Weston, actual prints. And I think that the first prints that I saw blew me away because it was so three-dimensional of Weston's work. We had Ansel Adams. We had Stevens. We had all the guys, Ruth Orkin, all those guys who were well known uh, at that time, but none of them had books. There were no books until later on. In fact, uh, it wasn't until Ansel Evans was on the cover of Time Magazine, that was 1979, because he had sold a photograph for $1,500. Everybody went crazy. 
15 feet high somewhere. That's ridiculous. You know? Now you think people are selling for gas for $50,000. But I think that at that time, <clears throat> nobody really knew how big photography was going to become. You know? and I, think that, uh, I felt lucky to be in the, in the history of that and all that moving forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you really blazed your own trail. And yeah. um, like, again, you were the first African American film still photographer as well. Can you talk a little bit about how one sus sustains oneself as a first, right, without the mentorship? Or... Well, I think that you can learn on your own, but you do have to have some instruction to understand light, to understand chemicals, to understand how that works. You know, you can't just have a digital camera go take your system, you know, put it up there. When we started, there were 36 shots in a film camera. That was it. So you had to be very selective about what you were going to shoot. You had to think about what it was that you were going to do. You only had 36 shots. Now you got digital camera, you shoot 5,000. Did I get a good one? You know, whereas in those days you knew at a certain point that you were going to have a good photograph, a photograph that was going to be memorable. Okay. So back in 1958, you you joined Life Magazine, right? And you no, were... I never joined oh. Life Magazine. I worked with you worked at oh. Life Magazine. I did some things for them, but I never joined the staff. Okay. I never wanted to be on staff. I never wanted to have a job. <laughs> I wanted to do I really realized because Gordon told me, he said, you don't want to work at Life Magazine you know, or any of the magazines. He said, because you do work and they edit it for their purposes. And he said, you have a, he said, you, he said, you have your own point of view. He said, just keep doing what you're doing. At first, I thought he said, he didn't want to be a competition worker. Uh, I said, but then, you know, um, I met one at a suite who worked at uh, Ebony Magazine, he told me the same thing. He said, How do you want to work here? He said, Your work, he said, You have a certain point of view. He said, and It's great. He said, You should stick with that. He said, It may not come overnight, and it didn't. <laughs> he said, But he said, You have your point of view, and you should stick with that. He said, Don't worry about working in for these magazines because in school, the idea of being a photojournalist, that, that was the idea. You know, we liked Eugene Smith a lot, we loved it. And uh, we like that whole school of you know, instantaneous photography in the street, that type of thing. Being able to capture a real moment in life. And we, we love that, doing that. So those were kind of our, our heroes, you know, that style of photography. Yeah. Sounds like you had a good mentor in him. Yes. Can you talk a little bit more about that mentorship or relationship? Well, I think that when Gordon saw my work, he realized that I was very serious about what I was doing. So um, we remained friends throughout his whole life because when I went to work with him at Life Age and I lived at the house with the family, Gordon Jr., maybe I think he was a year or so older than me, and we became tight. And we did all the running around with the girl. You know. <laughs> and Gordon had a swimming pool, so we would invite girls over there. You know. <laughs> I mean, it was a great, great thing. Oh, yes. So, Gordon Jr. and I were, you know, he played guitar and I played guitar. But he had lessons with Carlos Montoya. So he was really good. So I learned some things from him. From him. So we, we hung out a lot. <clears throat> but I think that Gordon and I got really close after Gordon Jr. was killed in that. Then, I mean, I used to talk to him every now and then, but after that, then I talked to him sometimes two, three times a week. You know, and when he was writing books and stuff, he would always ask my opinion about what he was doing. And then I, he learned some things from me too, you know, because I had the latest information about all things about photography. I could develop color film and things like that, extra chrome. I had knowledge of C prints and R prints, and that was new at that time. So I had to, you know, knowledge that. And one of my first jobs after Gordon was working in a cover lab, making our prints. So I had that information. So 
And then when I got in the movie business, he started asking me things like, what kind of film did you use? <laughs> yeah. You know, another time. And he did some work like that too. But I think that um, he was like my pops. You know? And he was very much like my father in the sense that he was dedicated to what he was doing. And Gordon was a hard worker. He wasn't, he didn't slack. He was very, I mean, he would work three o'clock in the morning and get to work. That, Gordon, I never knew anybody that put so much into his work and the time. He was totally dedicated to that. His writing, his photography, his music, all of it. He was, you know, very dedicated. And then you also went on to become a founder, founding member of the Kamungi, Kamungi, yeah. Kamungi Workshop. So for those of you who don't know about it, it's an important civil rights art collective, right? That worked to subvert the racist stereotypes of the black communities. Um, could you talk about how that came together? And how did it start? Well, it started actually, uh, it was 1961, I had done a picture of Louis Armstrong on the cover of Theater Magazine. <clears throat> they sent me to the Newport Jazz Festival to do these pictures. And Ray, who worked at a camera store uh, in Harlem, uh, he saw the magazine and he said, he said, I didn't know you were a black man. He said, that's a great shot of Louis Armstrong. He said, can you come uptown and help us? And he said, I got a bunch of guys, you know, they're mostly amateurs. I think um, Ray was in the Brooklyn in the camera store and clean work in Bellevue and um, different guys worked at different jobs. They weren't professional photographers that were facing so I went up and showed them what I knew. And then we started getting together. And then we said, well, if we're going to do this, and my thing was, <clears throat> I didn't want to be part of a group that people knew immediately was black. I was more interested in photography. I mean, the first name we had was group, group 35. I said, great, they'll know. You know, well, black later on, but the first thing they'll know is the quality of the photographs. So that's what I mean. But they all wanted to have this name. So we both, I think, Ray and I were the ones that didn't vote for it. <laughs> but then later on, yeah, it was good that we had the name of Kamunde. So I would show the guys what I knew, and then more people came, and then we would get together on uh, every Sunday. And uh, his wife would make chili, and we'd, uh, you know, have chili. And, wine, some of the guys would decorate their head. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it was for years. And then the guys began to learn, and then uh, most of them became really good professional photographers. So the show that was put together um, called Lou Draper and the Kamonga Photographers, Lou started writing in 63. He started writing notes in our meetings before the meeting. You know, so they start with 1963, but it started in 1961 when we were getting together and uh, taking pictures. But my thing was, and my teaching to the guys was, <clears throat> you have to take a really good photograph. I don't care if it's some black people, purple people, green, watermelon, whatever, you're taking a picture of. It has to have that quality to make it lasting. That was the main thing. And then we decided, since there were so many negative images about us in the media, that we would show that we were beautiful, that we were everything that any other race of people is. And so we kind of stemmed that tide of the negative images. And uh, the show is now started in Virginia, then it was at the Whitney, then it was at Cincinnati Museum of Fine Art, and now it's at the Getty. And I talked to the curator last week, and she said, and it's only been up about a month, and she said, the first two weeks, they had 70,000 people see the show. And they had all kind of comments about it. They didn't know that kind of work existed. It was a sensitive, and a lot of write-ups about it. But I think that that was the thing that I felt was important. Even though you're black, but you're still you know, an artist. It's not, I, I do black art, I do art. I just happen to be black. I, I hate that, and I hate the word African American too. I don't like that word. I'm a black man grew up in America. I'm not an African American. Yes, I have a 
well, I've been to Africa and all that. But the Africans don't consider me a brother in the sense of brotherness. They look at me as an American. Right? <laughs> You're not an African. But now it's beginning to gap, it's beginning to close because a lot of Africans are beginning to understand that you know, there's, there's a crossover there, especially in our world. But I think in the, in the beginning um, of the Kamonga group, it was very important, you know. And then Roy came in as so the first president, or the first sort of leader, and he had done a book with uh, Richard Wright called Sufi People of Life. And we kind of really loved the work that he did. It was, you know, showing black people as people. Not even something weird, but uh, the humanity, our humanity is the same as anybody else. Mm -hmm. So Roy became the first uh, sort of speaker. We got a gallery and we started doing things. So it led up to us finally having this show because <clears throat> Lou Draper's sister had given all this work to the Virginia Museum of Fine Art. And they saw and they said, This is great work. And then they, as they did more and more research, they found that he was part of this group called Kamonde. And so they decided to put a show together about the whole group. That's how it happened. And there have been shows and shows and shows, shows since and then. Shows and shows, yeah. So you've had this prestigious, epic career, um, collections, awards, shows. Uh, can you talk us through a, a few more of those highlights? What kind of highlights? <laughs> Where do you start? Huh? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I got in the movie business, and that was, that was very interesting, the story behind that. Um, I first worked on a movie with Ozzy Davis called Cotton Comes to Harlem, because he wanted black people behind the camera as well as in front of the camera. But, uh, and I worked that, that one job. Uh, I got that because I went to see Sydney Poitier and somebody said, you know, go see Sydney Poitier, he's a poor black photographer, and I went to see him. And he looked at my book and looked at my work. He didn't say much, he was very quiet. And he got to one picture and he closed the book and walked out of it. And I sat there for a long time wondering what was going to happen. And then his producer, Joel, came in and he said, the picture was still there. He, he saw a Stein and Carol beautiful shot of her. He said he had been engaged to her when they were doing the movie Paris Blues. And I guess it didn't happen. And he still had some kind of feeling. And I guess because it was a sexy picture, he was like, I just did it. <laughs> so, but then Joel told me that there was a guy doing this picture with Ozzy Davis. I didn't know what it was. He said, Go over and see this guy. And you know, I'd been through a lot of changes. I said, yeah, right, go see this guy. I get it done, see this sure. He said, no, 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 he said, he said, he said sit down, I'm gonna call him. And he called me right there and said, I got a guy here. He's coming over right away. And I went over to see him and he looked at me and he said, you're all right. I said, did you what? I had no idea. You know, I said, the photograph, what? He said, in the movie, he said, you know, on the sets, behind the scenes, the actors, et cetera, et cetera. He said, your work is perfect for the way you shoot. He said, you have these intimate pictures of people. So that was the first picture that I worked on. Um, and there were two guys working on the film that told me about there was a union. So I finally got voted into union in 1969. And then somebody just recently told me, uh, that I think a couple of years ago, another African-American photographer, <clears throat> he said, I've done the research on how many you know, black photographers in the union. He said, there's only 12. He said, you were the first one, 1969. I said, come on, man. He said, yeah. yeah. He said, you were the first one. And it was all analog at that time, yeah. right? Yeah. And so at some point, uh, you onboarded the digital, right? Or maybe well, yeah, switched yeah, from loved, analog loved to digital? digital? I loved digital. Yeah. I didn't have any problem. At first, I, in the beginning, digital wasn't happening. But as they improved it more and more, then it began to look almost anything, but you know, things that you couldn't, especially bringing up highlights and uh, opening up channels and stuff, but the things that you do digitally that you couldn't do at the time. How has that shaped your recent work? Like, or do you have a favorite camera? All my cameras are favorite. 
<laughs> I wanted to take the best picture. <laughs> well, now I got this guy. Yeah, talk about this. This guy. is the monochrome, the Leica monochrome. Fabulous camera. This is a very photographer friendly camera. You know, you don't really have to take your eye out of the camera because you see everything right there in your mind. You can just expose it here and here without even taking the camera away from I you can look at it here and the eye. When you look at the back, it goes off and the camera brings the image on the back. So it's, it's really, and it's sharp as heck. It's like 600 and some odd megapixels. The images you take raw with this, you can go outside the building. That's okay. So it's my favorite camera. Nice. <laughs> so did you use this in the, in the making of the book as well? No. Okay. There are no pictures in the book. <laughs> All those are negatives and analogs. I use an icon and candles and like them. So I want to turn to the book a little bit. We've got these two amazing editions. There's a trade edition, there's a deluxe edition. Um, can you talk about your choice to produce both? Like how did that come about and why why a book now? I ain't have anything to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> you have to talk to that lady in the Oh, okay. And, right. and Steve Albahari. I had a book before that. Uh, it's called. Um, uh, not, no, this is this book. Uh -huh. The other book is a big book published by Glitterati, and um, that book was the first book of my photographs. I was seventy-nine years old when that book was published. I was nineteen years old. Mm -hmm. That's the first book that I ever had about my book. I never thought that I would ever have a book about my book. I didn't really care. Mm -hmm. But that book happened, and then uh, this book happened. And mm -hmm. Steve saw the work, and he liked the work so much. I was kind of a little standoffish at first, since guys kidding me. But then he was very serious. Uh, he said, Do you trust me? I said, I don't know. <laughs> and then, you know, the more he talked about the photographs with my agent, you know, and I realized that he had a, a point of view that he had looked at the thousands and thousands of photographs. So he felt something of my work. Who am I to say he didn't? So we worked, you know, and he said, Trust me, I want to do my book of your work. And he said, You have these other pictures of all his, you know, my version of you. So I trust him. We argued a little bit. We're not arguing. I said, I don't like that. And she said, it's great for us. I said, I don't like it. <laughs> he said, well, it's pretty nice. I don't want to put it in the book. I think there were only two photographs that I didn't want in the book, that he didn't want in the book. And there were a couple of photographs he wanted that I didn't want in the book. But we, you know, it was a work in progress, mm -hmm. you know. But I had left a lot of decisions, you know, about the book to him. But I told him, I said, one thing I want for the book, I want all black pages. Mm -hmm. And I want no words or writing or dates on the photographs. I want those, I want people to experience the work. I said, most of the white pages, you look at it and you get after it. And I said, this book, you go from the image to totally black, which is a rest. It's like a rest stop for the eyes and what we're looking at. So he didn't go to the next page. Several pages of this black. But I wanted a book that made people look at the photographs. That's all that's on the page. There's no bird on the tree or a bottle on the table or none of that. I just wanted people to experience the book photographically. Even the writing is, is dark. Then you have to, if you tilt the book, which deals again with light, then you can see the black right hand to tilt let the light reflect that. So that's another dimension of the book. This isn't a book that you can go like this. So it's okay. nice. And the writing is a specific font, right? Yeah. Like it's in freight and freight sands, and these are typefaces designed by Joshua Darden. Right. right? And he's the first known African American type designer. Right. How did that come about? 
How did how did Steve the process? Steve. <laughs> <laughs> and did you have a role in that process, or was it all Steve? No, uh, when he did this, he sneakily recorded me talking. And uh, one day I said, "Say, man, you call me." He said, "He said, do you mind?" I said, "Well, you know, I've been saying things you couldn't be friends with." I hate that guy. <laughs> really, that's stupid, you know. So, <laughs> but he cut a lot of that out, but he still maintained uh, my sort of rhythm. And so they made erasure poetry, which was new to me, but I thought it was really great because if you read the white writing, it gives you an idea of what the rest of the words are about. So you can go read that and go back later and read the rest of the words. And then it gives you an idea of who I am as a person, which is a different point of view. You better never find out who the photographer is you know, that way. But this gives a picture of who this person is you know, in talking. Mm -hmm. Plus, it gives you the image. So it was different. So we have both copies. And yeah, the only difference in the copies is the deluxe edition has two platinum prints. One platinum print is probably 20 books. <laughs> so the platinum prints are, you know, uh, we had to make a decision about those two, but I think that, um, you know, platinum is longer lasting than any other process that I know. Even longer lasting than silver gel. So, uh, and it's, uh, Platinum salts printed into rag paper. That's something. And these ones made by hand. Printed. I didn't print them. Somebody else printed those. Plus, I don't know what to do. <laughs> but, you know, I, I saw each one inside each one. So, how do you envision students interacting with this book? Like, mm -hmm. either, like, how do, you, how do you see students interacting with your book? Either in a classroom or a studio? Or uh, they, they, they look at the book, and uh, I mean, the other book, Personal Vision, which is by Literati, there's a lot of writing in that that you get information from. But this book is a book that you have to live with. Mm -hmm. You have to, uh, one day, look at it, and get, get it. So I think in, in a classroom situation, you could probably discuss each picture or what it means to each person. What is that about? And you can discuss technique. Well, how do you do that? Because I don't put that information in there. Because I think it's not important. It's only important to curators. <laughs> <laughs> they go back and look, they want all that information. But being a curator, they don't necessarily understand, you know, unless they deal with you on a personal basis. Mm -hmm. Just reading about somebody from books and pictures and information doesn't really give you. And then you've got this book. Yeah, this is all, this book is all words. There's no pictures in this book. <laughs> this, these are the stories that a friend of mine actually wrote the book. He had me tell him you know, stories. Because I used to tell him, he's younger. I met him when he was 13 years old. Um, he's, I guess I was 20 or something. And he used to ask me, well, what do you do? And I would tell him these stories. So now he's 70. <laughs> he said, hey, man, we got to do a book. He would tell me these stories over all these years. And at first, I wasn't interested. And then he started writing stuff. And he showed it to my sister. It's interesting. These stories. And so he, I would talk and he'd write them. So it's, now he wants to do it. Now. I said, no, he said, no, you got other stories. <laughs> what about when you change 70? <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're thinking about it. So it's, you collaborated with 21st Editions mm -hmm. on this book, and you talked a little bit about them making the decisions. Mm -hmm. Is that sort of how the collaboration Well, went? yeah, I, he said, do you trust me? And I said, yeah, I trust you. So he would show what he was doing and ask me what I thought, and we'd discuss it. Like that. And that wonderful lady over there chose the image or the books, and she was adamant about it. <laughs> and I think it's the design job is just fantastic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. 
So I hope you all get a chance to see the copies that the library has. It's got those. Um, I know we have a number of students here as well. Um, so, and that you got a chance to be with students today, like mm -hmm. during lunch. And so I wanted if there were, like what you thought are the most important things that students in photography should know or need to be thinking about? Well, any, any student of any, any, any person in life, the first thing that you have to work on is your own knowledge and spirit. You have to, um, it's not outside of you. Your art is not outside of you, it's inside of you. And you have to work to become a human being. Now, what does that mean? That means you have to understand who you are as a person. You have to find out what is your destiny. What did the Creator put you here for? Everybody's life is important. Now, what are you here for? Just taking the space, eating food? <laughs> I think so. You have to realize that there's something that you're here to do. Maybe it's not art. Maybe art is just a way into something else. But it's very important for you to understand and deal with the energy and power that you have. Because everybody has it. You haven't been taught that. You know, I, I think that um, religion, education, and politics put you in a box. You know, you grow up, <clears throat> you learn, you get educated, you go to school, you get out, you get a job, you raise a family, you get grandkids, you get old, and then you die. That's not life to me. Life to me is about discovering who I am. Who am I? What are the things in me that's different than anybody else? Because everybody, just like a friend, is different. So you have to find out what it is in you that you want to do it, whether it's art or anything, you have to. It's inside of you, it's not outside of you. You're not taught, you're taught in this world to go outside of you. I mean, this little cell phone thing is, I thought television was bad. <laughs> <laughs> television came I thought television was terrible. You know? But I think that the cell phone has really got everybody. They lived their life with the cell phone. Information comes from there. That's not all the information in the world. Wikipedia is not the answer to everything. But I think get out, live life, just travel, go somewhere you've never gone before, and don't expect something. Just see what's there. Experience life. You know? Don't be angry at anybody. Don't hold on to hate. Realize that we all have to share love. It's very important. And forgive. You didn't make anybody down here on this planet. What right do you have to judge another human being? You don't know anything about it. You think you know, but you don't. You don't even know yourself. If you knew yourself, you would be kind and loving to every human being you meet. To the animals, the birds, the trees, everything. You would give the best of yourself. And that's what you should do. And then those things come back to you. If you make a space in your life and in your heart for love, it will come to you. If you make space in your heart for hate, that'll come to you too. Your subconscious will give you what you ask for. It's not what you do, you know, or even uh, what you think. It's, it's how you uh, express this God-given right inside you. And everything out there in the world tells you you don't have it. Do this, be a job, do this. But they're all taking your energy away from you. A job takes your energy away from you. You do it because you need money and you have to do family, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at it realistically, if you apply your energy to your dreams, they would come true. That's how you make dreams come true. When you were little and you wanted a bike or you wanted a birthday or whatever, how much did you think about it? You thought about it every waking hour. <laughs> well, you made a space for that to exist. And finally, it materialized because you make it to make it a space for it. It's true with everything in life. You make a space for it in your life. You say, I want to be in love with someone. I want this. Whatever it is you want, and it's to the better good of the universe, it will come. 
energy will come and help you do what you have to do. Because you're asking for it. I mean, it's in the Bible. I mean, all this stuff is this ancient information. Ask and you shall receive. That's in the Bible. It's you pretty know, powerful then, advice. You know, people read it. Man. You want something else and you want to make some out of it. It's very simple. If you extend yourself to somebody um, with how you feel, they feel it. And you walk down the street and you say, good morning. And you smile. Maybe that person is like, and you say, good morning. They go, good morning. Almost automatically. That makes them feel better. Without them even knowing that they feel better because they say, good morning, Mr. Grubb. You say, good morning, how are you? Oh, good morning. It takes them out of that thing. Think of energy like when you meet people. We all walk around with this energy around us. You know? We have energy around us all the time. We don't see it, but we live with energy all around us. Human beings do. Everything does. Everything has energy around it in the universe. And you deal with it every day. You make decisions every day based on how you feel, what you wear. You, know? you meet somebody. And they say hi or shake hand. They give you a hand like that. You go, ooh. <laughs> and it's automatic. You don't even think about it. But if somebody gives you a you know, fishy hand like that, you're like, I don't like that person. I mean, sometimes you haven't even met a person. They walk in the room or they move a certain way. You say, I don't like that person. Your energy is going there telling you you don't like the person. But a lot of people don't pay attention to those little things that happen to you. And it's always in the details. Life is in the details, not to be good to me. Everything all life is in the details. Pay attention to the details. That's pretty powerful. Pretty powerful advice. I wanted to open it up for uh, some time here for our guests to ask you sure. some questions. So um, if there are any audience members uh, with questions, I can repeat it and get that recorded. earlier that you had a uh, leg up on some of the people that you worked with initially when you got out of college. Was that from squarely a technical perspective or was it both technical and from an artistic perspective? So I'm going to repeat that just so we get it. Um, Kelly asked that, she said you had uh, mentioned that you had a leg up uh, in some of your professional practices in terms of like... Was it just technical or technical and from an artistic from, uh, was it from the technical or technical and, pers and artistic perspective that gave you a leg up on some of your other colleagues or competitors? It was technically, mostly, because I learned things in school that you couldn't learn unless you worked with somebody. And even then, what you would learn from them wouldn't be, you know, how to read a sensitometer. What is a sensitometer? You know, what is the photo lab index? That book doesn't even exist anymore. But in the photo lab index, you had formulas for developing film. It wasn't just D76 or D73. There were other formulas in there. There were other types of papers. It talked about how, what is solarization, how to do it, all these different things, how to make different types of prints. So it was a book for photographers. It doesn't exist anymore. I don't know why. It doesn't exist anymore. So it was more technical than anything else. Um, what role do you feel like community or collaboration has, has played for you? I think of photography a lot as sort of an individual act, but if there's also parts that involve people, um, you can talk more about what feels like independent work and what feels more collaborative or community. But I think artists work alone. First of all, you don't work with somebody. People do collaborative works, but the artist works from his own energy. The community comes in is do you connect to these people with these images? Then it becomes community. And the more people that vibrate, it makes community of people. Uh, you can work with people like Kamomi was a, a group of people. We work communally and in the community, photograph in the community. But still, it's from that particular person's point of view. Now, it becomes communal when 
people to get in and you say, oh, we like that, <laughs> you know, then you're connecting to the people. And I think that's, that's the big job of why any artist is to connect with the people. You know, you're, the artist is a, uh, um, how do you say, you're a reflection of the spirit, you're a doorway. And the more you get out of the way, get yourself out of the way, the more spirit comes to And then that translates to other people. Whether they know it or not. They say, they'll look at some areas and say, I don't like that, or I like this. They're making the decision based on who they are. That's all, it's all spirit. Spirit is in every living thing that exists. Iron is in the universe and all the chemicals and all the uh, uh, <clears throat> Everything, energy, electron, all of it that's in the universe is also in your body. You're part of the universe. You live in 15 pounds per square. I tell people all the time, so what do you mean? Well, yeah, try getting out of 15 pounds per square. It happens to your body. You live in a, in a dome of energy, 15 pounds per square. Everything that was ever here is still here. It sounds like you also have some more collaborations coming up. Is yeah. That oh yeah. Okay. yeah. How do those come to like come to be? They just reach out to you, or do you reach out to them? Both. Works both ways. I just recently photographed a Native American the tribe. They had this 347th meeting since the 1800s, and it was great. It was great. They like me and I like them. They look like me. Everybody thinks in into red. Everybody in is a black. Other questions? I'm going to repeat that so that people can hear in the back. The question was. Though you work with editors in the book, do you feel like yourself, like you yourself, are the true editor because you're working on the capturing the images? No, you're not the editor. You're the doorway to which the stuff comes. Uh, you get it. Sometimes photographers are the worst editors of ever work because they think that what they feel is like you know, it's not necessarily it's you. You have to show it to other people because sometimes somebody will tell you something about your work that you never thought about because that's another person. So editors edit your work, but usually if they work for a magazine, they edit it based on what their magazine goal is. Is that another question? Yeah, so you mentioned that you talked about the So the question is about uh, working off of emotion as a kind of way to drive photography. And are there photography works that come to mind that do that for you? Well, yeah. Ansel Adams, Edward Weston, <laughs> Eugene Smith, all those guys who really hit the nail on the head. You know, Cartier was song. I mean, he was, you know, forget about that. And he only had a 50 millimeter lens. He didn't have a telephoto or this. 35 millimeter like you know, with a 50 millimeter lens on it. But it was the feeling that he put into it, the things that he saw. You know. So yes, there are a lot of photographs that are memorable to me from you know, Stevenson's photographs of the horses in the wintertime, feeding them there. I mean, he's shooting in the snow with a box can. On a tripod, you see. And those guys were walking up into the mountains with these glass plates on their back. You know, photography wasn't always film. In the old days, these guys had these glass plates. And they were playing with, you know, flamboyant things, you know, gunpowder and all kind of stuff, you know, and they're coating these plates. I mean, photography wasn't like it is today, where it's easy, click, click, click. It was all a process glass plate that you had exposed. And then make a print, you had to put it in the sun. 
you know, to make prayers, you know, it's totally involved, you know. That's why I think if you're going to learn photography, learn how to work in the dark room. Take a shot, develop it, print it, and be excited when you see the image that you just shot come out and thing. It's not like digital, it doesn't build a little print on things, so I like that, I like that. You don't have that um, sense of touch and sensuality that is in photography, touching the actual print. That's great. That's great. Other questions? Yes. Do you feel that your painting is independent of your photography, or do you think that it, the, the two influence each other? The question is about. Andrew's painting, if it's independent of his photography or if the two influence each other? I'm an imagist. Everything influences me, but my photography is not like my painting. You can say this painting is indicative of Andrew's photography. My photography and painting are totally different. Two different mediums, two different things. But the feeling and the image is important. If I make a painting and somebody has a feeling about it, I'm one. You know, if I make a painting and you know, 20 people say it's awful, or maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I have to you know, run it by some There It was a poet back, way back, Basso. Uh, and Basso was, a, everybody thought he was a bum, but he would walk around and out. He wrote these poems, and he would show them to the people, and the people said, oh, that's terrible. He tear it up. <laughs> Other questions? Well, I did want to thank, oh, you did have a question. The question is, what are your hidden talents? Well, like I, started as, I started as a musician, so. But I, uh, I play the saxophone now. And I like writing poetry. And I'm involved in producing film right now. Do you cook? I'm a very good cook. I thought so. I had a sense of this. That's another hidden talent. Yeah. Yeah, my mother, you know, four boys and one girl in my family. My mother said, you're not going to depend on a woman to cook for you. You're going to cook. All the boys have their food. And then my grandmother told me stuff. And my father was a cook and a baker, so I, I learned how to cook. Girl. Somebody asked me, you would, when do you cook? I said, I cook every day. Fantastic. One more question in the back. Yes, thank you. Sir, if you would, for students who have only read about or heard about or seen a YouTube clip here and there of life in America in the, say, 50s, 60s, 70s, um, this idea of countering negative images of blacks in the media, um, could you give a little more context of it? I know you can talk about everything, but again, my larger point is, to the lay person, and I don't want to generalize younger people, but heard it, heard it, hear about it, see about it, but 
what did that mean to you from a lived experience standpoint? If you could give just a little bit of uh, insight. You mean living as a, in America as a black person? Yes, and being intentional about being proactive and countering negative images of blacks and people. Um, I try not to hold on to negativity, number one. That's a trap. You know, somebody calls you out of your name and you respond to it, that means they got you. They're taking you out of yourself. And what you have to do is realize that person doesn't know you. So whatever they have to say about you doesn't mean anything. It means something to them, but it doesn't mean anything to you. You do as an African American or a black person or a Negro or whatever you want to say. In America, you have to deal with it deals with you. Look at all the young people that are getting killed nowadays, men and women, they're young and old, for no reason. Cops stop him, and, you know, they shoot you. Well, I thought he was going for a gun, he was a pencil. Or oh, sleeping in the bed, she was sleeping in the bed where we thought she had a gun under the bed. You know, there is a definite, um, and it was happening in the 50s and the 40s, and it's changed a little bit. You know, I think there are more opportunities, et cetera, et cetera, to express yourself as an individual. But you have to concentrate on what it is you want to do. That's going to be there. You can play with it or not. The most important job for you as a black person in America is to define your destiny for every human being. But it's important for, I tell people this all the time, now is the time. Charlie Parker paid that years ago. Now is the time. And now is the time. Now is the time for you to come forward. As John Henry Clark said, the black man and the black women, woman wait in the wings on the stages of the world. And they await our angels. But well, we've already been here. Everybody's in Africa. Life started in Africa. I know. Started, it started. <laughs> Leaky proved that, and his daughter. They proved that the first woman, Annie, they named her, and that probably wasn't her name. Annie was the first woman to birth life on in Africa. Life started in Africa. But we've been, you know, so mistrained. Everybody, you know, white people too, y'all been brainwashed too. You think, you know, oh, I'm white. No, you've been brainwashed the same shit that I've been brainwashed. You know, you say, oh, St. Peter. St. Peter was in Africa. There are 12 saints in the African or Catholicism that were black. You don't know that. You say, St. Peter, this, you know, there would be no America without black people. All the things you enjoy was built on black. Uh, black people, cotton, a cotton made America. Not just in the South, but in the North, and half, in the whole world. Cotton was the money. That was the goal. And then even back in those days, there were some black people that had slaves. If you had slaves, you had money. There were black people that had slaves. There were Indians that had slaves. It wasn't just white people. That was the money. If you wanted to be, you know, you had 10 slaves or how many slaves you had, that was the money. But that's how America was built. Yale, Harvard, all, all you can name all these universities, they're all built on cotton. The cotton and slave trade. They built those universities and colleges in the higher learning area. So I think what everybody has to understand you know, is to understand American history. And you have to start with black people, where they came from, how they came here. Africa, I mean, the pyramids, come on, let's get real here now. The pyramids, they still don't know how pyramids were built. And those were built by people of color. How did they build those pyramids? When each stone weighed over a thousand pounds, how did they do it? So were they drug them the hill? No, they didn't. What kind of information and knowledge did they have? We have to open our heads to the world that in order to understand and change the things that are happening, where we have to be 
honest with ourselves as human beings, we're all human and we all bleed blood. We say, now if you don't bleed blood, I'd be like, oh, whoo, it's green. <laughs> Where are you from? You know, we all have a shadow. Every human being. It's how we share with each other. We're all breathing the same air in here. You can say, well, I don't like him. You can hate, but you're still breathing the same air. Everybody breathes H2O wherever you are on the planet. So we're all human. We're all connected. Anyway, let's find out what we can do together. You know, that's. It's a, such okay. a privilege to have your experience. I'm photography. I'm We but like hearing it anyway. Yeah, but right. I think it's important that we yeah. understand. Yeah. You'll take better pictures. There you go. When you realize that you're a human being and that you know, the, a bug can bite you out and you could die tomorrow. You think you're invincible, but you're not. You know, you're not. Why do people come together? Because we need each other. Why do we have families? Because we need each other. We need each other. Try being alone for a while by yourself. <laughs> I mean, really by yourself. Why do you think when they put people in jail, they put them in isolation? They go crazy. They go crazy. Any little sound, any little anything, they can live with it. We cannot live with it. Cannot live with each other. We, can, we got to have each other. Let's get to that. And then we will begin to have fun <laughs> on the planet Earth, you know. Then we can do other things and discover things and use them for advancing our minds and our stuff rather than making war. Well, this has been very fun. This yeah, has this been a good time. Yeah. It's supposed to be fun. Yeah. It's supposed to, it's not supposed to be, you know, all the same stuff. It should be fun. So it's such a privilege to have you here, okay. Andrew. We've it's got a privilege to be here, and I appreciate it. Yeah, we've got Pam Thank you. here. Thank you. Thank you. So we'd like to invite you to, to stick around, to meet Adger. Um, there's some refreshments in the back, and we also have Pam from 21st Editions here to my right. Um, we will be taking orders on the books if you're interested. Um, so again, thank you a thousand times, Adger Cowens, and thank you all for coming, and uh, please help me in thanking you one more time.